Hope you have your Bible. Sword of the Spirit, it's called. And there's only one book on this earth that I consider the infallible Bible, and that's that authorized version you have in your hand. Turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 3. I'm going to title the message tonight, Some Church Folk, or How to Drive a Demon Out of Your Church. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 3.11 For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word as it goes forth from the mouth of this messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul continues in 1 Timothy 5.13 by saying, And with all they learned to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. It's quite remarkable that not a whole lot has changed in 2,000 years. Amen. You had busybodies. What's a busybody? A busybody is somebody whose nose is constantly in somebody else's business. You learn that if you mature a little bit in the Lord, if you'll take care of your own business, you'll have all you can handle. You'll have all you can do. Just take care of your own business. Most of the time, you don't really know what's going on in somebody else's life. You really don't. None of us in here tonight are prophets or gurus. Swamis or anything else that this world claims to be able to look into a crystal ball and see what's happening in somebody's life. What we need to do is to tend to our own lives and our own relationship with God, and that will be a full-time chore for you. It will take you 24-7, seven days a week just to take care of your walk with God. Amen. Does me anyway. I guess I'm meaner than most of you, but it takes, it takes a lot of effort on my part for me to live for the Lord. The Bible said in 3 John verse chapter 1, verse number 9, here's another one of the church folk that you find. I write unto the church, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Who is that preacher? Well, you've met him. You've met her. Down through the years, you'll meet a lot of Diotrephes. Yeah. Say, who is that? That's somebody that thinks they're better than you are spiritually and that they can rule over you and tell you how to live and dictate every, as you know, as I said this morning, micromanage your life. That's diatrophies. There's a fine line that a pastor has to deal with when he pastors a congregation, preaching the word, sending it out to the people. And then when I cross that line, I get personally involved in your life. And I start micromanaging your life. And that's not my call. That's not what I'm supposed to do. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to minister the Word of God. But Diotrephes is everywhere. I've met him. I've, been, uh, I've, I've met him down through the years. I've seen how he can humiliate someone. Or she can humiliate someone in front of other people. And it seems like that they feed off of that. And of course when this begins to happen, you raise a spirit up in your church. Now, let me tell you something about the Spirit. The Spirit is everything about a church. It's your life. If you have the wrong Spirit in your church, it will kill the work of the Holy Ghost of God. Not that that Spirit is greater than the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is so gentle and so easily offended and quenched. And so you have to be very careful that you deal with issues that are coming against the work of the Holy Spirit of God. In Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 2, the apostle said, I beseech you, Adias, and beseech soon to K, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So apparently these two ladies were at constant odds with each other. It's all right to have an opinion. The fact of the matter is, if you use your brain, you're going to have an opinion. <laughs> if you think... And the, the, the world says today, well, so-and-so is so controversial. Let me tell you something, folks. The most controversial man that ever walked the face of this earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, when I came, I will divide households. I will divide them. 
And he certainly did. So we find people who are divided. Acts chapter number 8 and verse 18. We find this character also. He's one of the church folk. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. We have a term for that today where you buy and sell uh, spiritual gifts. It's called simony. It's named after Simon Magnus that we find in the book of Acts. He wanted to purchase the ability to give the Holy Spirit of God. Remember this, folks. The Holy Ghost of God is not given to people to give. He has not he is not on the sale. He is not for sale. He, he doesn't... You can't control Him. The Holy Spirit of God is the third person of the Godhead. And you have no power over Him whatsoever. This is a good thing for you to try to do. Find yourself a good born-again believer and try to cast the Holy Ghost out of Him. Go ahead. Conjure up every demon of hell you can find. And you try to cast the Holy Spirit out of a believer. You won't do it. Because there's no power there to do it. Greater is he that is in you, the Holy Ghost, than he that is in this world. The Holy Spirit is the dividing line. He's the mark of ownership. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Sealed by the Holy Spirit of God till the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is who God gives to us. As I said in the message this morning, where you know that you know that you know that you've passed from death unto life. In John chapter number 13, verse 25, we read these words. He then lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. And when I have dipped it, and when he had dipped us the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. That name Judas Iscariot means a man of Kirath, Judas of Kirath. After the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto them. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. It's quite a study to look at Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot watched him walk on water. He watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. He watched him heal the sick and cast out devils. He watched him feed 5,000. He watched the miracles performed at the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas was firsthand on the spot and observed all of that. In other words, Judas Iscariot observed all that Christ did. Could do. Yes, he did. I'm sure he thought in his mind since he was a thief and he held the bag. He thought in his mind the moment will come when I can steal from this bag because he was a thief. He was doing that which came naturally. He carried the bag. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. That of all 12 disciples, the bag winds up in the hands of a thief. And so he carries the bag and he stole and he stole. And he stole, and he stole. But he had not completely turned himself away from Christ because being with him, he realized that there was something different about this man. No doubt about it. Something about him that he'd never seen in anyone else. But remember, Judas is still a thief. So he follows him. And he follows him all the way to the Lord's table. Until the last supper. And to the moment that he sits there and he watches him come from disciple to disciple and wash their feet. He observed humility in one who could raise the dead. He observed humility in one who could cast out devils and heal the sick. All these things went through the mind of Judas Iscariot. But he was a thief. He was a thief. So the moment came when Judas crossed the line. He went too far. He had been offered the sop, which meant that Christ was offering to him one more opportunity, Judas. You can still get right. I'm going to die for you too, Judas. And he did. He died for Judas Iscariot. He died for every murderer that's locked up in Morgan County right now. 
He died for every murderer that's walking the streets of Knoxville, Tennessee. He's died for every man that's out here cheating on his wife, for every drunk lying in the, in the gutter. He died for every soul of Adam's race. By the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Get out of here, John Calvin. Christ died for all. Every man. You can preach to him and you can say to him, I don't care what you've done, who you are, where you came from, how low you've fallen in life. Christ died for you. I do not believe in limited atonement. I believe God can choose whom He chooses. I believe He can elect whom He chooses to elect. I believe He knows your name from the foundation of the world. I don't deny the Ephesians chapter number 1 for a moment. But Ephesians chapter number 1 does not deal with the whole family of God. Amen. Amen. So, Judas Iscariot walked out into the night. Where else can you walk when you walk away from Christ but into the night? Let me give you a warning. Judas Iscariot was privileged. He was allowed to be around the only man on the face of this earth like that man. He got close to holiness. He got so close to holiness that no doubt it did something to Judas Iscariot. You know why? Because when he finally sold him and his conscience smote him and he couldn't live with himself anymore, he took that 30 pieces of silver back to those Pharisees, to the Jewish leaders, and threw them back and said, I don't want this. This is blood money. I have denied the innocent blood. Who told Judas Iscariot that was the innocent blood? Why would Judas Iscariot define the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as the innocent blood. Of all the blood that had been shed from Abel all the way down to Christ, all of that blood fit in one category. But this man's blood was different from all the rest of them. And here is a man who denied him and sold him for 30 pieces of silver that says, I have denied the innocent blood. You know why people, when they walk away from Christ, they go screaming mad? Have you ever watched them? Have you ever watched them when they walk away from Christ? They become dope-ped drunks. They do everything that seems like they go as far as they can go when they get away from Him. Let me tell you why. There is no greater denial. There is no greater rejection. There is no greater unbelief than to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You have rejected the innocent blood, and you know it. And you won't be able to live with yourself, therefore you destroy yourself. And that's what they do when they go off into the kind of sin I've watched them go into. They're destroying them. They hate themselves because of what they've done. The Son of God is different. The moment the most intense fellowship with Christ, Judas left. Do you know how to get rid of a demon? Start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They can't take it. Now you can talk about the ministry and you can talk about the Baptist and you can talk about the preachers and you can talk about the singing and you can talk about religion. You can make all of your pet, you can make all of your banners and all of your stuff and hang it from the walls and swing from the ceilings. You can go on with all of the man-made religious junk you want to and you make all this stuff and it makes you feel good about yourself and feel good about your church and feel good about your preacher and feel good about your religion and Satan will swing from the rafters with you. That's nothing but dead religion. But when you begin to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, demons get very uncomfortable. They get very. You see, the average American is completely ignorant of who Christ really is. You know, he's the man upstairs, supreme being, you know, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. You get all of that over here in theology, the Christ, the Christ. Watch any man who can only say the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but, you see, that's religion. 
Religion is made by men to soothe men, to exalt men, to make men feel better about themselves. That's what's religion, that's how it's designed. It's man-made. But the Lord Jesus Christ can walk into the midst of a religious service and everybody gets uncomfortable. Oh, you say, preacher, I'd stand up and I'd, I'd worship him. No, you'd fall flat of your face. That's what you'd do. <laughs> If that door did not open, but someone came through that door, and you really couldn't see them, but you knew you could see them, and a presence came into this building, and it's a presence that would make the hair of your neck stand up, and a presence where you didn't have to say anything to anybody around you, just looked at him and said, there's something in here. And that presence became so strong you would crawl under these pews. You'd get something over the top of your head. And you'd hide. Because holiness had just stepped into your midst. And you'd be worshiping God. Proskuneo is the Greek word for worship. It literally means to prostrate yourself before God and worship Him. So I wouldn't of this. That's that that's that's for your flesh and for religion. That's that's all that is. That's nothing. You say, Well I enjoyed it, well go ahead, wave on. But one day you'll worship. <laughs> and when you do, you won't stand up, you'll go down. Now, how to drive a demon out of your church, I'll give you just a few points and we'll uh, we'll go home. Number one. Talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk about Him all the time. And get away from Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, who is that preacher? All I've ever heard about is Jesus. I know, that's all you have. The Lord Jesus Christ is His full title. That's His full name. There's no doubt who you're talking about. Because there's another Jesus. You see, there's another gospel. There's another spirit. All kinds of other Bibles. But there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, talk about His blood sacrifice. The blood is a barrier. It's a barrier. You can't see it, but it exists. Don't ever let some preacher tell you that there is no blood in heaven. That's garbage. We've got these guys getting up in the pulpit telling people, well, the blood is not the fact that he literally entered in with his own blood in the presence of God. What he did, he entered in with the representation of his life sacrifice and his life lived for you and his life gift. Listen, folks, you are not saved by the life of Christ. Meditate on that for a moment. He lived a sinless, perfect life, but that does not save you. It is the blood covenant at the cross at Calvary that saves. Well, what is the Bible talking about when it says we're saved by His life? He's talking about your life in this flesh, and He's living at the right hand of the Father, and He's ministering life to us as believers. That's what that's talking about. But you are not saved by the life of Christ. Watch the man, watch him, who spends all of his time talking about the Sermon on the Mount and what Christ did instead of who Christ is in His finished work at the right hand of the Father. Watch Him. Watch that theology. Because they're making Him into an earthly thing and the Apostle says we no longer know Him after the flesh. You say, we're not supposed to preach. Oh, yes, we preach. We preach the Sermon on the Mount. We preach the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God. But preach it in context. And understand that it is consummated, it is finished. At the right hand, the one thing the demon hates more than anything is for a Christian to stand up and say, Hallelujah, finally got it! It's done! It's done! And I can't add a thing to it. And I dare not add a thing to it. My salvation was paid for at the cross. Which brings us to righteousness. Abraham believed God and God imputed it to him for righteousness. 
wrote it down to his account, said, this belongs to Abraham. It is. Well, why didn't he make him righteous, preacher? He couldn't make him righteous because he wasn't born again. But when the Lord Jesus Christ ratified the new covenant, in other words, his death, Hebrews 9, without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. When he ratified it, in other words, gave it validity, he brought it into legal being. When Christ died on the cross, he brought the new covenant into legal binding being with God. From that moment on, the new covenant, you're born of the Spirit of God. You are born again by the power of God. And now here's what demons don't like. They don't like the idea that you no longer look at anything you do as your righteousness. Because your righteousness doesn't matter. You look at who is your righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness now. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians, he's made unto me righteousness. Well, preacher, you're saying everything that has anything to do with God has to be with Jesus. <laughs> Do you see what I just did when I put my hand out like that? I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you there's a nutball on YouTube. Say, there he is, Lawson's a Nazi. <laughs> I saw this nutball the other day on YouTube. You wouldn't believe it, folks. You wouldn't believe it. He couldn't find anything to get me over except this. He said, Lawson wears a bunch of fancy clothes. <laughs> Blue light specials. <laughs> Lawson wears fancy clothes. He made reference to my fancy clothes a half dozen times. <laughs> If I didn't have any more to do than that, it needs to get a life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He needs to start him a garden or go hunting or fishing or something. He needs to get, get saved what he needs. <laughs> All of my fancy clothes. Ask my wife how fancy my clothes are. Amen. She'll flat tell you in a heartbeat. I couldn't believe it. I thought of my, I'd never thought of that in a million years. <laughs> fancy clothes, brother. <laughs> Boy. But anyway, that's okay. That's par for the course. That's, that's the heat that comes in the kitchen. That's, that's what preaching's about. That's okay. That's okay. I pray for those people. I pray for them. That's all right. But the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is a righteousness that did not exist until He lived a sinless, perfect life as the God-man. When the second person of the Trinity incarnated himself in human flesh, the God-man started living on this earth. The God-man did not come down from heaven. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is from everlasting to everlasting. And then incarnate in human flesh, lived a sinless, perfect life. And all of the righteousness that he accrued, and the fact that he himself is righteous, that is what is my righteousness tonight. So what's that mean, preacher? It means that, folks, if you want to pick old preacher Lawson to that pick, I'll help you pick. I'll start you off and start naming off some of my problems. How many would like to hear him? But be warned. But be, be forewarned. If you start picking and consuming, you are going to get picked and consumed. If you're looking for perfect people, look in the mirror and ask yourself: Am I really perfect, or am I blind? The only perfect one that ever lived on this earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why His righteousness is my righteousness. Talk about the beautiful holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing how in the Bible that holiness is set in the context of beauty. And have you ever thought about that? The beauty of holiness. Beauty. It's beautiful. You see, we live in a generation that is so warped. They are so warped, folks, that they'll look at an automobile and say, isn't that sexy? I've never seen an automobile that was sexy. It's because you are obsessed 
It's because you don't know what beauty is. It's because you can't define terms. Listen, I worked on them for a living for a long time. You raise that hood up, get grease all over you, get shocked with about twenty-five or 30,000 volts a few times, and there won't be anything sexy about it. Believe me, I've jerked the hide off of my hand more than once trying to, trying to get in here and set the timing on one or, or move the distributor or whatever. Used to do things like that. They don't anymore. Cars I used to work on are, are old generation automobiles. But believe me, it's nothing but nuts and bolts and grease and steel and rubber. That's what it is. There's nothing sexy about it. It's because a whole generation identifies everything and defines it as it relates to sex. How many of you agree with that tonight? When you get a whole generation of people that understand, define, see things, and the only way they can understand it, define it is by sex, you've got a brainwashed society. There's no beauty in that, but there's beauty in holiness. Holiness is not righteousness, but you can't have righteousness without holiness. Holiness is not morality, but you can't have morality without holiness. Holiness is not sanctification, but you can't have sanctification without holiness. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying holiness is the bedrock of everything else that God is in His identity as the Creator. Holy, 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 apart, apart, apart. John chapter number 17, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I came from the Father, I'm going back to the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son, no man knows the Son but the Father. In plainer words, the holiness of God has to do with His being, His essence, separate from His creation. Untainted, untouched, unknown, unseen. Nothing can change the nature of God. You cannot. There's no way that you can taint Him. He cannot be tainted. He cannot be changed. He is immutable. Yet He stepped out. Of that separate place. Where is that preacher? Only God knows where it is. But he stepped out of that. Hebrews chapter number 1. That light that came down. And manifested himself in this world. The light that wrapped itself around the virgin's womb. That impregnated her. Mary was impregnated by the light of holiness. Impregnated her. Child is born. And for 33 and one half years. Walked on this earth and never committed a sin never failed in anything the holiness of God is manifest in the Holy One this Holy One the Lord Jesus Christ the, the, uh, the angel said that holy thing that's in your womb separate, separate, separate and yet God made Him to be sin for us no, no sin. I can't, uh, I can't wrap my mind around that. I believe it. I believe all the Bible, but folks, there's an awful lot of the Bible right here that just absolutely blows me away. I believe it from cover to cover. But if you're looking for somebody who has an answer for everything, it's not me. That one right there. How could one so holy become the essence of sin? But the Bible says that He made Him to be sin for us that we might be... Well, let's turn over there and read it. This is such a good one because that word shows up again in here. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5. Verse number 19. To wit, that God was in Christ... Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the righteousness into not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Now watch verse twenty one. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's a mouthful right there. But it doesn't stop there. Here's where holiness comes in. That we might be made, what? The righteousness of God in Him. If you ever get a hold of that, 
if you ever really get that, you'll understand. Yeah. That means that my little paltry life of do's and don'ts and the best I could possibly do and everything else is nothing but a tar pit compared to what he just said. Yeah. He said that the sinless, perfect, holy Son of God is my righteousness. And it is the righteousness of God in Him. So God the Father gave His only begotten Son. The Son left heaven. John 17, He said, I came from above, you are from beneath. He said, but I go back to my Father. So He sent His Son into the world. The angels and the cherubim and the seraphim cried, Holy, Holy, Holy. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ left that place of glory. They all stood in awe, marveled at what was going on because it was revealed to them as it transpired. Came into this world, lived out his life, died on the cross. There they observed him becoming sin for us who knew no sin. But he cried out to God in weakness. The Bible said he was crucified. Hebrews chapter number 5 says plainly that he feared there on the cross, knowing what he had become, he was completely vulnerable to God Almighty. Feared what he had become. God raised him from the dead. And now, on the third day, he rises from the dead and he comes up. And the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim all stand back in awe. Because he enters into the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. But he comes into the presence of a holy, holy, holy God as a man. And now he is equal with that holy, holy, holy God. Because he can sit down at the right hand of that holy, holy, holy God on his own righteousness. And the father says, the Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. God said to my God, Hebrews chapter number 1, God he called him. Do you think God the Father had ever called anything God? But he called his son, the God-man, God. That's something to meditate on. So now all that are born again, their righteousness is not their works. Their righteousness is Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Demons don't like this. They like to pick at you. They like to say, I don't do what you do. Well, I've never done what you... When God saved me, He didn't have to save as much as He did when He saved you. I was better than you. He didn't have to do a whole lot for me because I was already a good person. You've never been born again, see? You really don't understand what it's about. You have to understand some simple fact, and that is this. The potential is in every one of us. From Adam, we inherited it. Romans 5, by one man, death. The potential is in every last one of us to be the worst creature that ever walked the face of this earth. And if you won't admit that, then you've got a little self-righteousness going on here. And your self-righteousness comes against the righteousness of the Son of God just like that. They butt heads. There's no compromise. There's no dialogue. There's no living together. There's no understanding. Nothing. Either your righteousness or His righteousness. Let me tell you which one I'm going to take tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, if you want to pick, 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 Preacher Lawson, pick on. Because, let me tell you something, if you really knew everything that I'd ever done in my life and where I came from and the dark hell holes that I was in one time old years and years and years ago, you might say to yourself, I don't want a man like that preaching to me, but I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's what the new birth is about! Forgetting those things that are past, the Apostle Peter said, we press on! I'm not what I used to be. Satan wears me out with what I used to be. He won't leave me alone. And let me tell you, as you get older, folks, it doesn't get easier. He wears you out. He'll wear you out. But I know whom I have believed. And I can say with the Apostle Paul, I am chief of sinners. Well, then, preacher, that sounds to me like you're condoning. I'm not condoning anything. I'm just giving you a perspective 
how you see things. The Apostle Paul says, comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. And there's where you get in trouble. Demons love self-righteousness, but they hate the righteousness of the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Well, I've talked about that sinless life. How many of you believe he lived a sinless life? How many of you believe he's virgin born? I was reading a thing yesterday and this guy said, well, now we know by studying the original Greek and going back into history that, that, uh, that Jesus Christ is not really God. He, sure, he was a man, but he's not God. And he went on and he went on and he went on and went on and he never quoted one scripture, nor did he quote one reference, primary source from the first century. He didn't quote anything to back up what he was saying. He just rambled and rambled and rambled and rambled. Well, let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can change your life. Amen. And when He changes it, He'll change it forever. And here's one thing that demons hate. They despise it. They hate it. They hate it. Now, I believe in making the world as good a place as we can. I believe in medical science. I believe that we could, I believe all doctors aren't created equal. There are good doctors out there, and there's some you better leave alone. <laughs> yeah. Serious. Serious. I've learned the hard way in dealing with doctors down through the years. I've got a good family physician. I've got a good cardiologist, believe me. One of the best in the country. And, uh, and, but I didn't get there overnight. I learned how to discern doctors. So I would recommend that to you tonight. Be careful. Be careful. It doesn't hurt to get a second opinion. But saying all that is to simply say this. This is what we can do as men to help each other. Wouldn't it be right for you to do that? Of course it would. We want to be compassionate. We want to have part of humanity, humanitarian issues. It'd be good for you to feed some orphans. St. Jude Children's Hospital out here. It'd be, good to, it'd be good to support that. They treat these little children with cancer. That's all good. These are good things. But you see, that's all some people know. That's all they know. That's all they know. They've missed the main point. The main point is, you need to be born again. Amen. Not so much over morality and righteousness. Not really. Well, why do you need to be born again, preacher? Because you cannot enter where he is without a complete change in what you are. You can't go to where he is in your present state. You've got to be born again. And it starts with your spirit, the new birth. And your soul is saved. One day he's going to give you a new body. <laughs> For those of you that want, don't want a new body, say along. You also start giving you trouble. Don't worry about it. It'll happen. <laughs> it will. <laughs> Sooner than later for some folk. You'll be glad to get rid of it. You'll be glad for a new body. Folks, we are a people whose home is in heaven. Not on the earth. I will work with any man to help mankind. If we can clean up the water, if we can clean up the trash, if we can make the world a better place to live in, count me in. But that's not going to save you. You've got to be born again. Don't ever forget. Don't ever miss your calling. Don't ever, don't ever get sidetracked. Satan has all kinds of good things that you can get involved in. If that's what it takes to get you hooked, he'll make, he'll make you good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Our adversary, the devil, he knows exactly what it takes. He'll hook you hook, line, and sinker. And you'll forget that this is the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Is it not? How's that working out for the world? It got real quiet in here, didn't it? Maybe we're losing our saltiness. Maybe our light's not shining as much as it should, right? Maybe we're not being to this culture in America what we really ought to be. They expect us to join in with them to help, help humanity. Help humanity. Lord, man, help them. But that's not the salt of the earth and that's not the light of the world, is it? Father, in Jesus' name. Bless your holy word. Bless your word. Bless your righteous name. And the beauty of holiness. Beauty. Beauty. My, what beauty. 
Nope, and thy people bless them, feed them, encourage them, strengthen them, give them fellowship one with each other, and bless the house of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. All right, let's stand up here tonight. Yes, sir. Sure we can. That's a good song, brother. At the cross after we sing whatever you've got. 375 in the All-American Church Hymnal. Just as I am. Yes, sir. At the cross is a good song. Just as. 